Hello, what's up, everybody? Hi, this is Gavin Mail. We're going to get started with the mastermind here and a recap on what's going on with our buddy Salam. See how he's doing. I'm definitely going to be asking him some questions, hopefully. Now I'm a little more prepared, so. Um, hey, Ron, what's that motto that you have? Uh, another day in paradise is another, another what is that? Well, I got a lot of them. That's just because my rubber room of a mind. So uh, every day above fun, ground is another day in paradise. <laughs> another day, isn't it every day above ground and out of custody? Well, I add that. Out of custody without COVID <laughs> is another day in paradise. <laughs> so another in day rubber in room of a mind. <laughs> so another day I used, I used to say you know no matter what happens it doesn't matter what happens to you it's how you react to it so i cried because i had no shoes until i met a man that had no feet so stop <laughs> feeling sorry for yourself get up and get after it so every day every day above ground and out of custody and no and without covid With, without covid <laughs> <laughs> i got a call tuesday from uh, Salam's dad. The weekend before, I bought a bull over there. And so I got his number. He got my number, called me, uh, left a message, and then he called me again. And I taught, I picked up. And I said, hey, what's going on? Salam had a heart attack. He's in a coma. I said, oh, my God. Are you serious? What's going on? And he says, I don't know. It's not good. It's very serious, is what he said. Very, very serious. And I said, well, I... I He's he's in a coma. So yeah, um, and he said it was an induced coma, and I, and not familiar with exactly what that means. So uh, these are, uh, but a coma is a coma, as far as I know. I mean, it means that a person is out of it, and uh, that's my understanding. And so he tells me that it was very serious, and that he was unresponsive, and uh, that you know, it wasn't the time to leave him and, and whatnot. And he was very, but he wasn't upset. He was calm about it, but it, get, that was basically the facts that he had. So then I, we had a call on Tuesday night, Zeke, Michael came on, Chris Summers came on, a bunch of people came on there. Z, uh, you know, we all went on there and had that call and, and, and just, we're all positive about it. Nobody was, uh, was upset, you know, well, what was me? And I really try, you know, tried to help out and be positive say, Hey, you know, this is going to work out for the better. It's not the time. And we, I read Psalm 91, which was in, inspirational. Some of the people were very happy about that and thankful. So it, it, it people really came together. Uh, other people, uh, Serena, Sabrina, and some of the local people, uh, you know, they were going to go out there. And I think it, well, later on in the week, going to go out there and help out with the, with the farm animals. But uh, I don't know if that happened or not. It seems like, but either way, you know, the, uh, the vibe was that people were really positive and praying and, and sending good vibes out there for Salam. And I, I did a couple videos on it. I was just like, you know, when something like this happens, we just got to look at the bright side that it could be, it could be a blessing somehow something good could come out of it. You know, we don't know what it is, but something good could We, you know, I'd rather just try to look at it that way than just say, woe is me because how in hindsight, how devastating it would be, you know, when I, when I start really thinking about it, you know, to, to lose the guy. So I'm like, you know, I, I just didn't want to even entertain that thought in my mind, you know? So, uh, yeah, so we we just really stayed positive, and Michael Michael had some funny things to say, and it was good to have him back on Tuesday night, and Zeke did too, and Chris, and so we all we all just talked, and you know, then I got the call from Salam's dad. Was it was it third? Was it the next day, Wednesday or Thursday? And you know, he said that he's he's out of the coma, he's moving around. And the doctor said he's going to be he's going to be going to one hundred percent recovery. So that's the facts in summary that I have. So uh, with your permission, Salam, I'd like to be able to use this portion of the, of the audio <clears throat> to hear from you as to what, what happened. Do you need it? It sounds like you need a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's come back to you then. So we'll. Hello. Oh yeah. We're here. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Gavin, for all your help and support and, uh, prayers, especially. I think they definitely were the thing that, that did it. Cause, uh, I definitely am a, not so much a believer in the power of prayer. I know of the power of prayer. So, um, and I apologize that I'm 
slower today than I had yesterday. I was fine. But today I'm a little slow and uh, talking a little weak. But, um, uh, you know, it's kind of one, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. But I'm all right. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not as bad as I sound. I just, like I said this morning, I, I woke up a little weaker for some reason. I have much higher blood pressure than yesterday, but, but, um, you know, I feel, I feel all right. I don't have any recollection of being in a coma and, uh, I don't have any recollection of, you know, what my mom told me. And she said, I, she saw me like writhing around outside the barn and she, I was trying to get up or something. And so what's going on? I guess I was talking to her and, uh, and she said, uh, and then my dad came out and then they're like, well, do you want me to take you to the hospital? And I said, I guess I said, yeah, I take you to the hospital. And my dad threw me in the car, rushed me out here. And I was DOA effectively. And they, I guess with, they brought me back after like 20 minutes of chest compressions and shit, which I definitely feel. <laughs> um, that's part of why I'm in my, uh, <clears throat> my breathing, my uh, voice is not 100%. They they had me on, they had lidocaine patches on my chest the last couple of days. And then today, um, and I guess they're weaning me off of it. That seems to have made a difference in terms of the pain. Um, it's just a little bit more pain. And I can feel like my bones clicking whenever I breathe. It's kind of gross. So I still got some uh, chest healing to do. But, um, I mean, yeah, literally for the last two or three days, I've been feeling, you know, like, like, like fine, you know, just been hawking up some disgusting alien life forms from my lungs, uh, here and there, but, um, uh, <clears throat> I might have to do one before the end of the meeting here, but, uh, you guys won't have to listen to it, of course. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, grateful to, uh, for all the friends who came together for me. I appreciate that. I love you guys. And uh, I thank you for all your prayers and everything. And um, I'm sure I will make it through because I got I got a lot of shit to do. So, oh. um, and then real quickly, uh, I put out a uh, um, motion for Randy, the barber, to come on at 11 because he has a case management conference tomorrow. And I wanted to brief him on it because he did. I, I, and I don't, I don't know that he's going to get sanctioned or anything if he doesn't show up. I don't want any of that to happen. And he doesn't really know anything about it or what to do. So I uh, asked if, you know, I motioned for it to him to come on 11 so we can just kind of maybe spend 10 or 15 minutes just explain to him what it's all about and what he should say or not say or whatever. Um, since I haven't been able to really talk to him in the past week, I want, I want him to be uh, prepared for that. And then, uh, uh, other than that, I'm, uh, you know, if if I get out, uh, probably the, I, I would estimate um, if it was if if I didn't have like a slight setback today, I was thinking like I'll be out by Tuesday, but um, might be a little longer than that. So, uh, you know, I'm alive. So Tuesday, you, it sounds like what you remember is that sometime during the day you were out lying on the ground and your mom found you and then took your dad took you to ho the hospital and you were dead. That's what I understand. I wasn't breathing and I wasn't, uh, I don't think my heart was beating because I had a blockage in one of my arteries. And so they opened that up the stand. And then they're going to look again at my heart today because, like I said, uh, um, I just feel a little bit weaker today for some reason. My blood pressure was crazy. It was like one, 152 over 110, which I haven't had in a while. Um, not since the last time I was in the hospital. So, uh, uh, but yeah, um, it, um, I, I don't have any record. I saw, here's what I do remember. You know, I've been doing uh, fasting as a way to manage this condition because I didn't know exactly what it was. 
I don't trust doctors. And so I was like, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm dealing with this myself. I, and for the last year and a half, when, you know, I've been having these, experiencing these recurring breathing problems, which I think I've talked to you guys about. And so what I, when I would get to where I'd feel like really congested and my breathing was stunted, you know, I kind of had short breaths and stuff. You know, now I realize it's, it was the, the uh, blockage. But I would, um, I would fast for a day or two or sometimes three. And I would know, like, you know, I could feel it. I could feel when, it, when uh, the congestion was returning, and, uh, you know, just this, this, hard, you know, hard to breathe and, or difficult to breathe or challenging to breathe, you know, different levels. And so when it, got, it when it would get to a certain point, I would be like, okay, I got to, you know, fast for the next couple, three days. So that's what I did last week. And uh, it, it, I was good for about a week, and then it started coming back. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to uh, start a fast tomorrow. And I think that was tomorrow would have been the day after the night that I, you know, had the full blockage. And and uh, and uh, yeah, like I have no recollection of s- struggling, you know, falling or struggling, try to get off the ground. My mom said she she the the I was outside the barn, apparently, outside the small door that's there in front of the barn. You could see from the house. And she said she saw me, she saw something out there. And she came out, and it was me, like, writhing on the floor, trying to get up. And then, you know, that's when, you know, she asked, you know, are you all right? What's going on? You need to go to the hospital. And so, yeah, from there, uh, I, like I said, I have no recollection other than I knew that it was time to do a fast. And that would, um, you know, the autophagy would kick in within 24 to 36 hours and start clearing out that blockage enough to bring me back to normal functioning, but obviously not enough to fix it entirely. So now that uh, you know, I'm here in the hospital, uh, put the stent in, uh, they're going to look at my heart again later on today, see if there's anything else needs to be going on, but, you know, they... they um, it might just be, you know, weakness from not getting enough sleep or whatever, because you know, I've been watching the news and stuff and what's going on in the Middle East and all that. So I should probably take a break from that. But, um, yeah, that's, that's the story, man. Hmm. Seems okay. So it seems like, uh, you, you don't remember being dead. You got down there and you, you, you were in a coma. So is it, is a coma when you're dead and you come back? How does that how does that work? What what exactly is this coma? Well, that's what you're you're just unconscious entirely, and you're non-responsive. Your body function is still there, but it's like you know, depending on what kind of coma you're in. I mean, I'm not an expert, but you know, you're generally just you're you're just out. You're out, and uh, to the extent that you said. Or, or that my dad told you they put me into a medically induced coma. I know they do that to, to patients sometimes because that way they don't struggle, they don't have pain, and they can just work on you and uh, you know fix you up and, until you're until they got you stabilized, and then they take you out of the coma. So uh, so it could be very well that that's why all my memories were gone it's because. When you have a, a, you know, when you fall into a coma like that, you kind of lose your memory of of preceding events. So that's probably what was going on. So it sounds like they put you in a medical. You were in a coma, and then they continued it to help work on you. Yeah, something like that. You mentioned that prayer helped you. You didn't say you didn't just thought it. You believe it or you know it. What what was your experience with that? Um, it's actually a long, lifelong experience of just knowing of, uh, of not being careful with my words and wishing for certain things or wanting certain things, but not, um, but not, you know, not like being intentional about it. And the Bible talks about this. I'm not sure if Psalm 91 does, but it talks about in the Bible 
you know, that if you want something from God, you have to be very intentional and very specific about, or not very specific, but, you know, you can't be ambiguous about it. And so I noticed that sometimes when we would, you know, kind of idly think about something, um, a few days later it would manifest. So here's like the best, this is the first example that I can remember. So as a kid, I was like, I was seven, and there was another kid at school, and he had gotten stitches in his head uh, for, for something. And then I, I was like, and then I ended, <laughs> I don't know why we ended up getting a fight and I smacked him with my thermos in his head where hmm. his wound was and he was afraid it was. Anyway, so after that, I was like, hmm, I wonder what it's like to get stitches. Well, <laughs> the Lord gave me that experience. Like a week later or so, we had some chickens and there was, uh, they were, we had a pen for them. But they really didn't have a, uh, uh, like a, a shelter, right? And I felt bad for them. And I'm like, I need to, I want to cover these chickens. So we just had like this chain link coop with those barbs at the top, you know? And so I was climbing up there, trying to put boards across the, the pan. And like my hand caught on one of the barbs and ripped it open. And I still have the scar. It's on, it's between my index finger and my middle finger on my left hand. And I got seven stitches, which is also interesting because it's a, you know, very significant number. But, you know, in, in, over time, I remembered back to that situation. And that was like the first time where it was, it was almost like a prayer, you know, I wonder what it's like to get stitches. Okay, here you go. And so, and there's other things, you know, that, that, that have happened. Did you call? No. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. Did you flush? I didn't. I actually just farted. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to sit in the chair so I can change out your bedding? Okay. And so, uh, so yeah, I started to realize the intentionality of your words and how important it is to. Here. Sorry. how important it is to be intentional about your words and your thoughts because if you let them if you let them just uh you know roam wild then they're gonna they're gonna come back on you and attack you i guess is the way you can say it so it's it's very important to be intentional with your thoughts and your words and so i got into a habit actually over the last i don't know 20 30 years when i figured out what was going on Whenever I'd have an evil, not an evil thought, but, you know, thought or, or I think something that could be bad, I realized, oh, wait a minute, I might be setting myself up. So I would, I would immediately say, well, that's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. And I'd repeat that three times. And it, it's, you know, I think I live by that. You know, it, it actually was, uh, um, uh, I never had a, you know, major issue. Now, whatever's happening now, it's a completely different story. But as far as like, you know, the power of prayer, power of the intentions of your words, it's very important. Like I said, that's something I learned. And uh, and then Gavin, you know, when he had the, the prayer meeting on Tuesday night, I think that could pretty pretty clearly demonstrate to anybody who understands this why. I probably came out of uh, my situation uh, so quickly because you had people who genuinely cared about me and put their words of intention. And it's actually, if you go to uh, the Bible in Isaiah 55, 11, uh, God says, you know, my word shall not return void. It shall go out into the world and accomplish that which I intend for it. And so that's you as well. We're all gods. And so when you put your word out in the world, it's an energy cord, you know, and if you've ever heard of like, uh, the butterfly, effect, you kind of think of it like that, a butterfly flapping its wings in South America can cause a hurricane in New York, you know? So if you, if you have thoughts or you, you know, say intentions, they're going to manifest. So that's why I'm saying you have to be 
you have to be careful about the words you use, thoughts you have, so that they manifest in a positive way. And that you be careful not to have idle thoughts. And, and, the, and again, the Bible talks about that too. In the Psalms, in the Proverbs, you know, be careful of your thoughts, don't have idle thoughts, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, yeah. Tuesday. So Tuesday night, yeah, while we were having that prayer call, you, it seems like that was when you were blacked out in the coma, dead. Right. And we, uh, well, we were really, on there. Well, you're not dead when you're in a coma. You're just in a coma. But were you dead before that? Did they say? I, up, according to them, yeah, I was DOA. By the time my dad got me here to the hospital, I had to get me out of the car and start chest compressions. And, and I, I, what I'm told, uh, it took them like 20 minutes to get my heart back going or something. So, yeah, I was I was technically dead. At that point. Wow. So the, what we what we did must must have sent a sent some message to you. It did Isaiah fifty five eleven brother. So your word went out into the world and, and accomplished that. All your words went out into the world and accomplished that which you intended. And that's what that's what brought me back. Isaiah fifty five eleven. Yep, one of my one of the one of the ones that's one of my standbys. Isaiah fifty five eleven, Romans two eleven. There's no, there was no respect of persons with God. Um, what's another one? There's a bunch of really good stuff in there. You know, Romans two eleven, I like a lot because it it, it, um, it kind of lays out the legal principle of persons. It literally says in the King James version, "For there is no." Um, uh, you lost that so further. But there is no, there was no persons before God, meaning God doesn't care if you're a king, prince, president, a pauper, a regular civilian, whatever. You're a man to him. You're his creation. And so um, he doesn't see your person. He doesn't see. And, and it's again, it's a very it ties directly into the to the law stuff that we discuss all the time. The person is your persona, you know. And you take on many personas. So anyway, it's just for there matter. for there is no respect of persons with God. For there Romans is no respect of persons with God. Yeah, and you read you read the whole verse there or the whole chapter, and you get a better understanding of what it's talking about. But that's what he's saying. He doesn't care if you're a king or a pauper. You're his creation, and he's not going to um, treat a king any better than a pauper. He's going to treat him equally because their person doesn't matter them as the man or the woman that man and then yeah, king 55 11 isaiah so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which i please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto i sent it there you go so it'll it'll prosper in bad manifestations too like i said if you're not careful about your manner your intentions and the words you speak and the thoughts you think. So at all times, that's why, you know, like Ron, Ron is, he's going to live to a thousand and two, you know, because he's such a positive guy for as long as I've known Ron. He's never been angry. I've never heard him raise his voice. Uh, you know, and, and he's like, he, he's, he's, Ron, Ron has it. I figured it out. I don't know that he, you know, knows specifically, but you know, that's, that's the kind of person we should all aspire to be to. Not that you guys aren't, you're, you're pretty level headed yourself, Gavin and, and Zeke, you know, once in a while Zeke will maybe get frustrated, but, uh, you know, I'm certainly, <laughs> I would consider myself the, probably the least, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the group in terms of anger. I get angry a lot, but I try not to. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it, the intention is the, is a very important thing because your word will go out and it doesn't return void, meaning it doesn't, re it doesn't do nothing. It does something and it does what you intend for it to do. Yeah. Very important verse. 
Ron shared something here in chat. Uh, if you, Ron, oh, it's, hold that, on. <clears throat> that's just shit that I've come across a long time ago that since Salam went through what he went through, you know, you know, just like for me and you to meet, going back to the date of Christ, there's almost 41,000 people, 20,000 on your side and 20,000 on my side that created us to even be here today. And in a hundred years from now, no one will even know who the fuck we are. So let's just focus <laughs> on what's important. Yep. Yep. That's so true. Seems like you're talking about the the lineage, Ron, family tree. Yeah. I'm just talking about, you know, if you go up to that thing, you know, you had two parents and then grandparents and so on and so forth. You know, just going back for 400 years, we each needed there were 8,192 ancestors just for us to be created to meet each other. And that's 400 years. You go back to Christ, it's, you know, 40,900 people. 40,000. Oh, 4,906. See, uh, yeah, it's a doubling. It's a doubling. 1, 2, 8, 16, 32, 64, 120. But, but the point of the thing is look at how many people that have gone through time just to where we are. And then if you take what we're what I put after that, that w in 100 years from now, you know, how many people know who their grandfather's father was? We're just a fucking portrait on somebody's wall. I've had people ask me, who's that? Oh, that's my great grandfather. Never met him, but I got the picture from my family. So mm -hmm. the last thing is Buddha. You know, the biggest mistake we make is you think you have time. Time is free, but it's price priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. Keep it, but mm. you can spend it. Once it's lost, you never get it back. So you are almost gone, Salam. So everything you got from the other day on is is fucking a blessing to you. Uh, and us because totally you're agree. still around. Yeah. yeah, you know, and it's funny because <clears throat> I'm going to have to pause here in a second to talk this loogie, but Mm -hmm. Um, I had been talking to Zeke a couple months ago about creating a living trust because I have a, you know, I'm a computer collector, big in that hobby, I'm a big mover and shaker in the hobby, which is actually huge now, there's tens of thousands of computer collectors all over the world. I started it, you know, uh, collecting really when I was a kid. But by 1997, I created this event called the Vintage Computer Festival to bring people together, celebrate old computers, because you know, I'm a nerd. That was my thing. And it's still going on today. 25 years. Is yesterday, last year was the 25th year anniversary of the event. And there's events all over the world now, literally, that I spawned, which I'm proud of. Um, but the, uh, the problem is, you know, one day, all of a sudden, you'll see a bunch of good stuff coming up for sale. And you'll be like, oh, shit, who died? You know, because people amass these collections. Some of them are hoard. Some of them are well curated, like museum quality. I know it runs the gamut. So I was thinking, you know, I don't want it. When it's very chaotic when somebody does pass and there's no succession for their collection. It's it's a, it's a boon to some people, um, but you know if you look at it in terms of like kind of what Ron was saying about the people who got you here, you know, wouldn't you rather have your work and all that value? Because some of these computers they could literally be worth millions of dollars, you know. Like my collection in back in 2010, 20, 2013, it was ultimately stolen from me because I. You know, was not. If I knew more about Ritz, I would have probably not have lost that collection. It was a one to five million dollar collection back then. It was a ten thousand. I had a ten thousand square foot warehouse full of uh, over three thousand computers and tens of thousands of books and tens of thousands of magazines and thousands of peripherals and just everything related to computing. I had hundreds of thousands of individual items. It was a massive collection. I'd been collecting for a long time. Now it got taken from me by corrupt landlords. Fucked me over. That's a whole different story. But anyway, like I was saying, you know, it's, it sucks when all of a sudden you see a bunch of nice stuff coming here. And you're like, oh man, somebody died. 
and they didn't take care of a will or anything. So I started on the idea of I wanted to create a living trust. It's a very easy uh, trust to set up and it protects all your, your stuff. And it, it's good whether you have a computer collection or a boat collection or whatever collection you have, you know, if people just do that, <clears throat> then, you know, put their stuff in the living trust, you get to continue administrating the trust. You get to continue using the stuff. Nothing really changes. You know, technically you don't own it. The trust does, but you still get to use it and you still get to manage the trust. You're, you're the trustee. So you still have full control of it. But then when you pass or something happens, um, and this is actually the, see, this is also another thing. Like if I had, if I had put all my stuff in trust back in 2012, 2013, before the landlord stole it, I could have come in as the trustee and said, yeah, these people have my stuff. Because, you know, Salam, the guy who owed them back rent, which, you know, wasn't that much. I had gotten into behind on rent with them before. I had been renting with them for like five years. They were great people. They never had an issue with it or whatever. But that, I don't know what happened. I think, I speculate that, I don't know, they knew what was going on. Somebody talked to them maybe, and they were calculated about it. Because, like, you know, they evicted me. It's like, okay, well, you know, I want to get my stuff. No, too late. You can't get your stuff. Fuck you. Hung up. So if you have a, if, if this, if the stuff is in a trust, they can't do that because the trust is a separate entity. It's a separate person. So you can go in there and be like, I'm the trustee of the Salam Abraham computer trust. You need to hand over all the property right now. We're going to sue the fuck. So I was talking to Zeke about creating this living trust product to cater specifically to computer collectors and Anyway, the, uh, the reason I brought it all up is the irony is, you know, I'm on the verge of getting that together, and here I, I almost die, and and my collection that I've rebuilt over the past uh, many years, selling off the, because I ended up with about 20% of the collection I used to have. Unfortunately, it was most of my good stuff. I always had it with me, like at my house or at my warehouse. In Livermore, the warehouse in Stockton is the one that I, I, I was evicted on. Um, but uh, I started to sell that off and then reacquire other stuff because I, you know, my interest changed. And, and I, I have another, like right now I have a world-class collection sitting inside the barn and saves cabinets. It's all well organized and everything. And I want to make sure that if I do have to pass, that my sons will get the value of it. And they can do whatever they want. They can sell it. They can burn it if they want. But it'll be theirs to make the decision. And so, yeah, my motivation in wanting to create this trust, is living trust product, is number one, to help people to avoid this. Number two, it's a good business. You know, I'll probably sell them for, I don't know, 50 to 100 bucks a pop, train people on how to, how to do it. And, and uh, and then, um, you know, kind of make a side hustle on that. So yeah, it was ironic that um, <laughs> that I hadn't even finished mine in this half. I've been given a, another chance, so I'm definitely gonna redouble my efforts on that and get that done. Yeah, it seems like you got some. Like Ron said, you got this extra time, man. This is a this is a gift. So it sounds like yeah. you're gonna really utilize it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Zeke, what's going on with you, buddy? You got uh, any questions or comments? Well, I was going to say that, you know, really the um, there are two things. One, about the uh, being intentional with our words. That really is um, what we learn in law. It's the same thing in the legal deal, which the Bible is law. And so we have to be specific. We find that out and we know that. And the other thing about the time, you know, when my uh, when my boy was three years old, or well, actually one year old, he bit his tongue, and it didn't stop bleeding. And we waited three days to take him to the hospital, and he lost two thirds of his blood. Oh God! And um, they got in there, and then they they did tests, and they realized that he had hemophilia, and so they just gave him this thing because it wouldn't stop bleeding 
because it, it was in the in the mouth and the the moisture kept the ble bleeding going if it had been cut anywhere else the air would have healed it and so um you know, he lost two thirds of his blood, but after they figured it out the next day, like he was already, you know, recouping and we just said, okay, we'll take him. And they're like, oh no, you got to check out and all this stuff. And we said, no, nah, he's good. And then we went and um, he didn't need to get, start getting shots for another two years, actually. But the whole deal was um, I'd lost him. And so from that point on, I, it was a second chance. It's like, okay, you know, we lost him. So now we don't have to stress. I mean, we lost him. So it's like a whole new game and it's a new thing. And you, you just start a whole new outlook on life. So I didn't worry about him the way I might have worried if it hadn't happened. So that's how I see it. Um, and, you know, you, you're the uh, pretty much of a heartbeat of this meeting. And I'm thinking, uh, well, you can't leave us. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, how devastating that would be, man. It was it was just I didn't want to entertain that even that thought. You know, I'm thinking like yesterday I had a call and I'm thinking like I did the I kind of told the other people what happened. And and I said, you know, I, I was like a little bit choked up because I was like, you know, he's bounced back. He's going to be 100 percent. And I'm thinking like at that point, now that it's OK, I was like, oh, man, you know, I, I just want to say how, how devastating it could. You know, I don't want to you know, I didn't want to entertain. It's just that entertaining the thought of uh, of losing the guy was just be. It, it was just, it yeah, would not that's be. What, that's what Zeke's talking about. You know, you don't consider it a loss. We're grateful. If I were to have passed, then that yeah. would have been that. But now that I'm back, it's a it's a new game. Yeah, we're grateful for the for the uh, second what? chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like that happened to your son, your your boy Zeke. Yeah. Hmm. So, so he, did you get to see angels or God Salam when you were dead? <laughs> to the extent I did, I have no recollection. I have no recollection. My cousin just visited me this morning. He's like, "Do you remember me coming and seeing you in ICU?" I'm like. I don't even have any recollection at all of ICU. I just remember waking up in the, uh, you know, regular room where I'm in now. I got out of ICU within uh, a couple of days. So that, I have no recollection. I, I have, I, like I said, the only recollections I have is <clears throat> knowing that, okay, you know, this chest congestion, con congestion, breathing issues that I've been suffering with for a year and a half, which now I know turned out to be the uh, blockage, which I put a stamp in, <clears throat> um, was, uh, you know, I, I knew that I needed to uh, do another fast, a main, what, what I consider a maintenance fast. And uh, so I knew, you know, I was going to start on that the next morning. And so it was that night, you know, that, uh, that everything went down and like i said i have no recollection of anything that anybody told me so my my memory ends last um you know like last tuesday or whenever it was and began when i uh woke up here in the uh in the hospital room and you know they're asking me do you know why you're here i'm like uh, when so what really? day and time did you become conscious um uh, let's see what's today sunday um, uh, Friday, Friday, probably like Thursday. I think Thursday. I think that's mm -hmm. when they moved me here because I'd stabilized. 